Open your Bibles, please, to Second Peter, chapter two. The title of this morning's message is The Depth of Depravity. And there are many voices coming from pulpits of the churches across our land today. There are many people speaking many things, and there are many ears that are giving heed to the message that's being proclaimed. The question is this, is the message that is being proclaimed the truth? You see, the pulpit is a place where truth is to go forth. It's not the place for discussion. It's not a place to take an opinion poll. It's not a place to see what the congregation would like or what they'd like their church to be. It's a place where truth is to be read and explained and applied. And the congregation is to hear and understand and obey. The problem is that there are many people who have entered into the ministry who have not been called of God. God has not called them. He has not sent them. And they did not do their hearers any good. They are false teachers, wolves in sheep's clothing, who have come to destroy the flock. And many flocks do not have the discernment to see through the disguise. Other flocks have rejected the word of God and have sought out teachers in accord with their own desires. I'd like you to turn, please, to Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8, you can save your past place in, in uh, 2 Peter. But turn to Isaiah chapter 8. Let me just say that Isaiah the prophet was dealing with many false prophets in his day. He was dealing with men who claimed to speak for God. And the people were all too willing to listen to them. Indeed, they had heaped upon themselves teachers because they had itching ears and they wanted to hear what they wanted to hear. They didn't want to hear the truth. Now, we must ask ourselves the question, how far are people willing to go to get their ears tickled? How far do they, will they go? To what end will they go to pursue their, their own desires? The people in this verse that we're considering were actually asking for something hideous. Chapter, this is Isaiah 8 and verse 19. The people in this verse were actually asking to consult the mediums and the spiritists who whisper and mutter. This was a practice that was outlawed by God, but the people had strayed so far from the truth, they didn't care what God had to say anymore. This true prophet of God responded in outrage and said, should not a people consult their God? Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? What information can a dead person give? The answer is nothing. But the voices of the, that the people were seeking were demonic, and these demonic voices gave their hearers pseudo-truth. They said things that sounded right to men. They said things that, that the people wanted to hear. But the Word of God says there is a way that seems right to a man. The end of that way is the way of death. And so Isaiah issues this declaration, which should burn in the ears of anyone who would stand forth and speak for God's people, or speak to God's people. And it should burn in the ears of anyone who calls himself a true disciple of Christ. Where do we turn for the truth? Isaiah, Isaiah says this in verse 20. To the law and to the testimony, that is, to the word of God, to the only source of truth, 
And then he says, if they, that is, if the preachers you have heaped to yourselves do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. They are the blind leading the blind. And both will fall into the pit. There are many preachers, if you wish to call them that, today, who have rejected the word of the living God and have re replaced his message with another gospel, a social gospel. But it is a message of death. It will lead its followers to hell. Paul was dealing with this when he was writing to the church of Galatia. And he was, well, to, put it, to use his own words, he, says, he said, I am amazed. I am stunned that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. And then he says this, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, is to be accursed. That is devoted to destruction and the fires of hell. That's what it means. As we've said before, so I say it again, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, he is to be accursed. There is only one message that is to be proclaimed in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is the message of the word of God. I've been walking you through this epistle of 2 Peter, and in chapter 1 of the epistle, he begins, he starts out the letter by laying out those glorious foundational truths that make up the Christian life. He begins by pointing us first and foremost to the Lord Jesus himself, declaring that he is our God and Savior. It is Christ who has saved us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. We have been called out of the world, out of our old lives. We've been set off free from the tyranny of the devil, and our feet have been placed upon the narrow road that leads to life. Then Peter declares that the true disciple of, of Christ, having been delivered from darkness to light, will display certain characteristics which will mark him out as belonging to Christ. Having been granted true saving faith, the true Christian has been supplied with everything pertaining to life and godliness. And the result will be a transformed life, a life characterized by several qualities. And if you look in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5, you will see these listed. It's always good when in the scriptures, the writers give us these lists so that we're not left to grow up and wonder, what, what is it we're supposed to do? What is it we're supposed to seek after? What is it we're supposed to pursue? Listen to what he says. In verse 5, he says this, Now for this reason, because you have been bought with Jesus Christ's blood, because you are owned by him, because you have been set free from the tyranny of the devil, because you are a new creation in Christ Jesus, because you belong to him, now, and because you've been given everything pertaining to life and godliness, now for this very reason, he says this, so applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. These qualities, these characteristics will set the true disciple apart from the mere pretender who only masquerades as a Christian for the true disciple of Christ will only follow him. He will not listen to the voice of another but will run from a false teacher. God's people follow Christ for he alone has the words of eternal life. Peter then speaks of the blessing of being allowed to be an eyewitness of the transfiguration of Christ on the holy mountain, and he finishes off the, cha the chapter by challenging us to know the word of God. And it is not nearly a compilation of cleverly devised tales, but rather the product of the Holy Spirit. And he says in verse 20, but know this first of all, this is 2 Peter 1.20, but know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. In other words, you don't get to decide what it means. 
God spoke. He said what he meant, and he meant what he said. And we've got to deal with what he said. It's not open to one's own interpretation. And here's why. No prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. This is God's word. This is God's message. God wrote an entire book for us. He declared the truth that we need to know so that we might live for him. The word of God alone is able to make one wise unto salvation. And the word of God illuminated in our minds by the Holy Spirit is able to lead us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. The word of God is our shield and protection against the lies of the evil one. And thus, Peter has set the stage for what follows. False teachers. False teachers are just that. Liars masquerading as pastors and preachers of righteousness. But unlike the true man of God, they do, they do follow cleverly devised tales, stories made up in their own fertile minds inspired by the devil, which leads their hearers to hell. And they are merely following in the footsteps of the false prophets of old. And understand this. These wicked men are skilled at using the terminology of true religion. They can twist the scriptures, and you never know they did it. But we know that these evil imposters twist the scriptures merely to exercise power and control over others in their insatiable pursuit of gain. For their God is their bellies. Their end is destruction. They set their mind on earthly things, things that are going to perish. They view godliness as a source of gain, not knowing that the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. Not money, the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. And some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. And Peter is issuing a warning to all who will listen. False teachers have infiltrated the church. They are here among us secretly introducing their destructive heresies and turning the grace of our God into a license to sin. Now I want to emphasize that these false teachers of Peter's day were passing themselves off as true men of God. They weren't openly declaring themselves to be false teachers. They didn't introduce themselves by saying something like, good morning, I'm a false teacher and I'm here to lead this entire congregation down to hell. No, they were much craftier than that. They were actually claiming to be God's men with a message from him to the church. And this shouldn't surprise anyone who knows the word of God, for he warned us of this when he said, such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ for no wonder. Even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as, men, as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. Satan has always had his ministers in the church, tares among the wheat. And Peter gives us the clearest description of false teachers in all of Scripture. They are apostates, a term that comes from the Greek word apostasia, meaning defection. It means a revolt. It's used in the New Testament always of religious apostasy. A variation of the word, word speaks of divorce, a separation. These people have separated themselves from the truth to pursue a lie in, a, in, in pursuit of gain. Now remember that Peter has said that these false teachers will pass themselves off as teachers of truth but they have abandoned the true faith for the wages of sin. The epistle, in the epistle of Jude, that man was concerned with those who had infiltrated the church in order to corrupt it with false teaching. They were trying to do it unrecognized, under the covers, so to speak. They were passing themselves off as preachers and pastors and reverends and fathers and priests and whatever else. And know this, the undiscerning and the lazy one who will not apply himself to the study of the scriptures will not be able to spot the liar. I want you to turn to the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 9. 
because in that book, we have a, a good illustration of how easily people can be fooled. And in chapter 9, beginning at verse 3, we read of the account of the people of Gibeon who had heard of how no one could stand against the armies of Israel because God was fighting for them. And so they came up with a plan. They had a scheme. They decided they were going to fool the people of Israel so that they would be preserved. And so, picking up at verse 3 of Joshua chapter 9, it says this, When the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they had destroyed those cities completely, these men, these people of Gibeah, also acted craftily. Same idea that the false teachers use. And they sent out envoys, and they took worn-out sacks on their donkeys, and wineskins worn out and torn and mended, and worn out and patched sandals on their feet, and worn out clothes for on themselves, and all the bread of their provision was dry, and had become crumbled. And they went to Joshua, to the camp at Gilgal, and said to him, and to the men of Israel, We have come from a far country. Now therefore make a covenant with us. And the men of Israel said to the Hivites, Perhaps you are living within our land. How then shall we make a covenant with you? But they said to Joshua, We are your servants. Then Joshua said to them, Who are you, and where do you come from? And they said to him, Your servants have come from a very far country. They didn't name the country, and nobody caught that. They just said, We come from a very far country. Because of the fame of the Lord your God, for we have heard the report of him and all that he did in Egypt and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon, king of Heshbon, and to Og, king of Bashan, who was at Ashtaroth. So our elders and all the inhabitants of our country spoke to us, saying, Take provisions in your hand for the journey and go meet them and say to them, We are your servants, now then make a covenant with us. This our bread was warm, when we took it for our provision out of our houses on the day that we left to come to you, but now, behold, it is dry and has become crumbled. These wineskins which we filled were new, and behold, they are torn, and these are clothes, and our sandals are worn out because of the very long journey. Interesting. They took great pains to deceive the children of Israel. So the men of Israel took some of their provisions, and notice this, they did not ask for the counsel of the Lord. Had they done so, this issue would have been resolved. But they didn't. They hadn't learned anything. You see, when God had just destroyed Jericho, the children of Israel suddenly got full of themselves because the very next city they went to was this city called Ai, and they were, Joshua sent some spies up to check it out. And the spies came back and says, it's just a little place. Just two or 3,000 of, of, of the guys have to go. Don't let everybody have, have to go. We can take the city. And they were destroyed. Because they did, first of all, one of their guys had taken something that didn't belong to him. He had sinned against the command of God. And so the children of Israel were under a curse, but they were they didn't know it, but they had become full of pride. We can take care of this. We can take care of this little city. They were destroyed. And so they came back, and when they finally figured out what had gone wrong, they repented, and they went, then they went out and took the city of Ai. But now, again, they fall back into the same situation of pride. They didn't check with God. God would have told them, these people are Hivites. They're living within the land. You must destroy them. Do not make a covenant with them. In verse 15, Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live. And the leaders of the congregation swore an oath to them. And it came about at the end of three days after they had made the covenant with them, they heard that they were neighbors and that they were living within the land. But by then it was too late. Do you understand? Do you see what... what from this illustration, we must be on high alert. 
We must be on high alert at all times, having prepared ourselves with the knowledge of the Word of God, and we must be in constant prayer for wisdom and discernment from God so that we will not be fooled by the liar. Back in 2 Peter chapter 2. And consider this description of these false teachers that Peter lays before us. In chapter 2, in verse 1 of 2 Peter, he says this, False prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be maligned, and in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Here's a list of the things being taught by the false teachers. They will introduce destructive heresies. They will will introduce teaching that will destroy the people. They will deny the master whom they claim to follow. They will have a hold to a form of godliness, but will deny the power thereof. They will be characterized by sensuality, unbridled sexual lust is what that means. The way of truth will be maligned by their doctrine and by their conduct. They will be characterized by greed, and they will exploit their followers with lies, false words. The doctrine of the false teachers is destructive in that those who follow it will end up in hell. They make the claim that they are God's people, God's messengers, while denying his authority, or as I said, they hold to a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. They are characterized by sensuality, literally unbridled sexual lust, and they teach their followers to do likewise. This is a destructive heresy. Since these false teachers declare that it's okay to commit adultery and fornication, their followers will pursue that. The Gnostic false teachers of Peter's day said that your body was going to sin anyway, and that God understood, so go ahead and indulge yourselves. And the false teachers of our day declare that you have your fire insurance, so live any way you want, you'll still get to heaven. Further, these false teachers are characterized by greed, and if you have spent any time researching false teachers, you'll know that their God is indeed money. The sermons proclaimed by the health and wealth Pentecostal preachers is merely a sales pitch. Send in your money, and I'll send you a blessing. And they fleece their flocks of every penny they have promised, and they have promised what they cannot deliver. In this way, they exploit their followers with false words. But there are consequences for such wickedness. Destruction and eternal judgment await these false teachers. In fact, Jesus said, that it would be better if a millstone were hung around the necks of these men and they were dropped into the depths of the sea rather than lead one of God's people astray. And so Peter shows us then the precedent already set for the destruction of these wicked men using the examples of the angels of sin, the civilization of Noah, and Sodom and Gomorrah. Now we looked at this last time, but I'm just going to give you a review. I want to keep these things fresh in your mind. It's important to remember these things. It begins by stating in verse 3 of 2 Peter 2 that their judgment from long ago is not idle and their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, and if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having, been, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly thereafter, and if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unspiritual men, for by what he saw and heard that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. Well, let's take these, these in turn. First, we have listed the angels of sin. There were a group of angels, one-third of them to be exact, who apostatized, that is, they defected, revolted, sinned, and that they did not keep their first estate, but abandoned their proper domain. This occurred at the rebellion of Satan. 
They joined him in his rebellion and were cast out. And they are now the demonic horde that serves him. And like him, they will suffer for all eternity in hell. But there were some angels who did something so heinous that according to verse 4, God has cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. Jude says in verse 6 of his epistle, the angels who did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. So while the demons are still at large to do the bidding of their master, whatever these angels did was so over the top, so horrendous that they're even now kept in chains. And they too will have their part in the lake of fire that burns with brimstone. Next, we are given the account of the destruction of the world of Noah. We know from the Genesis account that the world of Noah had corrupted itself to the point that God had decreed judgment upon it. But even in wrath, he remembered mercy, for he had Noah preach to them for 120 years before the hammer of judgment fell. Sadly, none, of them, none listened. And on the appointed day, God told Noah to go into the ark, close the door himself, and ended the lives of every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth, as well as all the animals. Out of the total population of that world, only eight people survived. The next example given is the destruction of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Jude says that these rebels who indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Now what did they do? Well, what, does the, what does the Bible mean when it says, speaks of gross immorality and going after strange flesh? Let the scriptures declare to you what this gross immorality is. Turn to Genesis chapter 19. Genesis chapter 19. We'll pick up at verse 1. Genesis chapter 19, beginning at verse 1. Let's set the stage here. God had visited Abraham. And then he was sending two angels to Sodom and Gomorrah. And when he told Abraham about it, Abraham began to intercede for the people of Sodom. And he started with 50 people. He said, if there are 50 people that are righteous, will you, won't you spare the city? If there are 40, if there are 40 to 35, if there were 30, went down to 10 people. And God says, I won't destroy it if there are 10 people that are righteous there. And as soon as he has finished speaking, they, God departed and the angels, according to chapter 19, to verse 1, the two angels came to Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he arose to meet them and bowed low with his face to the ground. And he said, Now behold, my lords, please turn aside into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet, and then you may rise early and go on your way. And they said, However, no, but we will spend, this night, in a, we will spend the night in the square. And yet he urged them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house, and he prepared a feast to them and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, surrounded the house, both young and old, all the people from every quarter. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came into you tonight? Bring them out so that we may have relations with them. This is not just, hey, let's have a conversation. The word is the Old Testament, let's say the... The King James Version, they use the word know, that we may know them. It's an intimate word, speaking of the intimacy of the sexual relation between a husband and a wife. These men wanted to rape the angels. But Lot went out to them at the doorway and shut the door behind him and said, Please, my brothers, do not act wickedly. Now behold, I've got two daughters who have not had relations with a man. Please let me bring them out to you and do, not, and do to them whatever you like. Only do not do nothing to these men inasmuch as they have come under the shelter of my roof. They weren't interested. Listen. They said, stand aside. Furthermore, they said, this one came in as an alien and already he's acting like a judge. Now we will treat you worse than them. And so they pressed hard against Lot and came near to break down the door. But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves 
trying to find the door. Even struck blind, they burned in their lust for these men and would not stop what they wanted to do. This is a picture of ugliness. Back in our text, we read of the fact that the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah indulged in gross immorality. The word comes from the Greek word ek pornuo. Pornia is the word from which we get our English word pornography. So you know that we are dealing with sexual sin. And what Jude is speaking of is a compounded fornication, especially gross. And ek, out of, indicates that their fornication was out of sync with their nature. We know what the people of Sodom and Gomorrah were engaged in. Homosexuality is sexual sin outside the normal course of nature. These men made a deliberate move away from the order that God had created. They deliberately became apostate. They made a direct move out of their appropriate place. In fact, the term sodomy is a direct re reference to that which characterized the people of that civilization. Consider the words of the Apostle Paul who writing under the direction of the Holy Spirit in his epistle to the Romans said, for this reason God gave them over as they had rejected the truth of God and rejected God's commands. God gave them over to degrading passions. I remember reading this one time to a group of youth and they, and they said, was this a bad thing? And I said, degrading passions. Degrading. This is not a good thing. Gave them over to degrading passions, for their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way, also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. Paul is speaking directly of the judgment of God upon sinful mankind for their rebellion against his created order. And this is a reoccurring theme throughout the scripture. As you study the Old Testament, it's brought up again and again in Deuteronomy and Amos and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Zephaniah and Lamentations, Ezekiel. It's brought up in Matthew and Luke and Romans and Peter and Jude and Revelation. And you know what happened to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. God incinerated them. The other cities in the same area, according to Genesis 19, were also consumed. Some archaeologists have said that there is evidence of a great rupture in the Earth's strata in that place. According to the geological research, a massive explosion occurred near the south shore of the Dead Sea where the, these cities were located, which lifted the entire section of the valley floor into the air and then dropped it down, burying them all so that these cities were literally buried immediately under the onslaught of burning fire and brimstone out of heaven. In one hideous moment, everything was gone. When Abraham, who had interceded for the people of those cities, awoke the next day, the whole area was engulfed in smoke like from a gigantic furnace. And Peter, speaking of these false teachers, warns them that their judgment from long ago is not idle and their destruction is not asleep. Unless they repent, they will undergo the punishment of, of eternal fire. Hell is God's final everlasting judgment on sinners and in particular those who defect from the truth. Revelation 19 and verse 20 describes it as a lake of fire which burns with brimstone, just like that which fell upon the cities of the plain. Revelation 20.10 says that the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet also are, and they'll be tormented night and day forever. And it says the cowardly and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. That's where it all ends. But I want you to notice that within the description of judgment, in the description of these horrors, God protects his chosen ones. They will not suffer in the judgment of the ungodly, and in our text, he lists two specific men, Lot and Noah. God had mercy on Noah. Indeed, he must have stood out like a city on a hill compared to the people of his day who had so perverted themselves that God had desire, decided to erase them all. 
But Noah had found favor in God's sight, and indeed, in Genesis 6, God lists three characters of Noah that should be part of the life of every true believer in God. He says, Noah found favor in the eyes of God. These are the, res- the records of the generation of Noah. Noah was, number one, a righteous man. Number two, blameless in his time. And number three, Noah walked with God. He was righteous, meaning that he lived before God doing that which was right in God's sight. He sought to live by God's righteous standards. Next, he was blameless in his time, meaning that there was no practice of wickedness. There was nothing that anyone could point out to malign Noah. The description here is of a person who is above reproach, which, by the way, is the first characteristic required for one who would occupy the office of elder. And lastly, and most importantly of all, Noah walked with God, which puts him in the same class as Enoch. This speaks of deep intimacy with God, which again should characterize all of God's people. And God delivered Noah and his family from the destruction that overtook his world. Then there was Lot, whom Peter describes with the same words used of Noah, righteous. Lot lived in the wicked city of Sodom, and Peter, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, declares that he was oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard, that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. God had mercy upon Lot and his, two, and his wife and his two daughters, delivering them out of the city before judgment fell. Of course, we know from the scriptures that Lot's wife didn't make it. As they were entering, and this has always shocked me, as they were entering the city of Zoar, the place of safety, they were safe. They made it. But Lot's wife looked back longingly to Sodom, and she died on the spot, becoming a pillar of salt. Now these things were common knowledge for the Jews in Peter's day, and it is common knowledge among those who are students of the, of the Bible today, but despite this knowledge, there are those whom have I, I've already said who have rejected the message of the, of the Bible and have replaced the true gospel with a perverted message of how to improve society through monetary reparations for past sins and by repenting for the deeds of our ancestors that, if, that they may have perpetrated. And the bottom line for these modern false teachers is the same as it's always been. They seek money and power. And they will go to any length to get what they want for there's no fear of God before their eyes. That's okay. That's exactly what I just read. <laughs> it's all good. This is what we... We have to keep this... Hey, look, it's another one. <laughs> we have to keep the truth of the Word of God always in the forefront of our mind. We have to guard ourselves against the lies of the evil one. We have to prepare ourselves for the lies that will be perpetrated upon us. People will tell us things and they'll use Christianese and they'll try to make us believe what they're saying is the truth, but we must know the Word of God. That's why I used that passage at the very beginning, Isaiah 8, 20. We must go to the law and to the testimony. If they're not speaking from this word, if they're not speaking according to the word of God, they're liars. We must be rooted and grounded in the word of God. This is the only way we can stand against the the wiles of the evil one. We must know the truth. The only way to fight a lie is with the truth. There are many lies. There's one truth. We must know the truth. What did it say, the scriptures say? You will know the truth and the truth will what? Set you free. 
The people of Jesus' day, the, the religious leaders, were so blind to the truth that when Jesus said these words, he, he said, we're not in bondage. We've never been in bondage to any man. Because they understood he was talking about being enslaved to sin. And he said, we've we never been in bondage ever. Seriously? Read their own history. They've been, they've been enslaved since they left Egypt. After they, got, after they were freed from, from the slavery to Egypt, they went to the Promised Land. Then they were enslaved by the Moabites and the Midianites and the Philistines and, the, and whoever else. Every time they sinned, they were enslaved. At that very moment, they were enslaved to the Romans. The Romans controlled the world and they were the slaves of the Romans. And yet they couldn't see the truth. They were blinded by their lie. And that's why Jesus says, if you abide in my word, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I'll stop there. This is my dismount. So, Lord willing, we'll pick this up next time. Just know this. There are false teachers are everywhere. They're telling lies. They're saying things that sound right, they're saying things that appeal to your flesh. They're saying things that will lure you away after God. They're trying to distract you. You must know the truth. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for the time you've given us in your word, and I pray in Jesus' name that you will cause your word to accomplish its purpose. Don't let it pass in one ear and out the other. Don't let it be like in the parable of the soils where the seed fell on the stony ground or the seed fell on the hard path and it was snatched up by the devil. Don't let it fall into the stony ground where it grows for just a little while and then, then withers and dies. Don't let it fall into the weedy soil where it's choked up by the desires of this world. Let your word accomplish its perfect work in the lives of these people here today. Let your name be glorified as you do so. Have mercy, I pray, and cause us, I pray, to be living witnesses of the truth. As requested, I lift up President Trump and our country. Lord, there, there, are, there are things afoot that cause us to understand the passage where Jesus spoke, saying, men's hearts will fail for fear because of the things that are coming upon the earth and yet we are not like those who have no hope we belong to you cause us I pray to cling to you and to stand firm in your truth we pray that you preserve President Trump's life and that of his family I pray that you cause th this nation to be brought to its knees before you before you determine that it is too late have mercy, I pray. Visit us in grace. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and you're dismissed.